the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the holy and holy thunder and lives breathless but all in wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free sing for all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nation with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who is slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me sang the song last week, so hopefully you know it now. It's called Jehovah Rapha. God, Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, you're our healer, you and you alone. We will trust Say, look up 
to where I have come from. If everything around us says there is no hope, we're never going to let go of the hymn of your own. God, Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, you're our healer, you and you alone. We will trust you, Jehovah Rapha, you're your power you'll do what can be done either now or forever we know it's gonna come God Jehovah Jehovah Rapha you're our healer you God, we come to you this morning with thanks in our hearts, God, for another week, for being here today, for breathing. God, move in our hearts this morning. Pray for those that aren't here, whether it's they didn't get up on time or they're sick or something's going on with their family. God, be with them too. Be with everyone watching online this morning.
Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal, stolen your bread, sang my own song. Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. The shackles I wear, I bought on my own. The scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away.
chorus one more time. The scarlet sin had a crimson cost. You nailed my death to that old rugged cross. An empty slave at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled. The scarlet sin had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. Jesus, we thank you for paying that price for us. We thank you for saving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we need a hallelujah after that. What do y'all think? Amen. Oh, come on. How many of y'all have had your sins rolled away? All right. Welcome this morning, guys. If you're visiting, I can't see because of these lights in my face, but if you're visiting, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, I've got some announcements we're going to go through just real quick before we get on to God's Word. First of all, if you are new and you haven't gotten our app yet, use this little QR code to get it, and that will get you connected with all of our activities, with prayer requests, anything that's going on, this is your way to it. Uh, we also have another QR code. If you want to give online, you can do it through this, uh, this code. It'll take you to our website. We also do it the old-fashioned way. If you want to put it in an envelope, we've got boxes in the back. <sighs> I need to take a breath. Kids Church, we have a great program for our children here. They'll be dismissed to Children's Church when worship is finished. You go out this way, go out on this side. Uh, Wednesday night, we're starting something new. Now, you really need to hear this. We're going to start Wednesday night Connect, and we are going to have a meal. This is just for six weeks. We're going to have a meal at 545. Uh, this week, the meal is beef enchilada casserole with sides and everything. It is $5 for adults. $3 for kids, but it's $15 for a family. So it's a real economical way to feed everybody before church. Then at 6.30, we'll have activities for all ages. If you're coming to eat, please make a reservation so we know how many to cook for. Um, we also have our community supper clubs. If you haven't gotten linked up with one of those yet, see Keisha or see Candace. Really, any of the regulars you see around here can get you to the right person. We really would love for you to be involved in this. It's a great way to get, get to know other people in the church that aren't part of your little group that you hang out with. Um, and finally, we have Coffee Club on Friday. It's at 8.30 a.m., at Cancun's in Red Oak, and it's just a real relaxed time to visit and have coffee. Started with the senior adults, but any age is welcome to attend. Is that all of them? All right. All right, I usually pray here, but I think we did a lot of praying this morning. Are you all excited to be here today? Amen. All right, we're about to hear a great message from Doug. Let's get ready. Good morning. About right now is my introduction, the role and everything. And I guess we missed that. Thank you so much for being here on this holiday weekend. I know we have several that are out traveling, and we thank you. But you probably have started noticing a theme, uh, which is Connect. And we've talked about connecting, and we talked about it uh, uh, quite a bit, and we're just continuing with that. The theme for September is going to be the power of connection. And this is going to be talking about the connection that we have with Jesus, the connection that we have with individuals, connections that we have with family, and the connection that we have with church. But the, I, I guess the, 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 the way to start this, I tried to, try to figure out an example that would probably be best when it talks about connection. And it would be similar to buying a electronic appliance, such as a TV, a microwave, uh, a, a, a blender, whatever that you buy, and you buy that appliance, and then you bring it home, you unbox it, but then you don't hook it to electricity. You just let it sit there. Obviously, it doesn't function the way that it needs to function because 
Uh, we didn't hook it up to the electricity of what it was meant to do. And I think that was probably, even though it was kind of a weird example, I think that's the example of that that is best described about our connection, especially to Jesus, and our connection to our family and church and individuals and those that are, that those that are around us, that it really matters about connecting uh, to those that are around us. But today we're going to be looking at our connection to Jesus because it is the most uh, needful connection that we see within our life. Now, if you have your app, you can follow along with me there. You can follow along also on the screen behind me. And, uh, but this, th today we're going to be looking at the most needful connection, even though that all other connections are needed, but this connection is the most needful connection that we can, we can have. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 13. And I'm going to break these up into scriptures because this is going to be talking about that this is Jesus at the, at the uh, Sermon on the, on the Mount, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. He gives us four, uh, four, uh, four stories or four contrasts about what we need to be connected to him for. And now, he not only tells us about the, the things that we should be doing, but he tells us about the things that we shouldn't be doing. And so, on your screen now is going to be the two, the two connections, the two ways that's coming up on the screen now. Uh, come on, one more. There we go. There we go. It's going to be the two ways, the two trees, the two followers, and the two foundations. Now, I don't know if you have ever read through the Sermon on the Mount, or I don't know if you've ever really read the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but it was fascinating to me when I started looking at this and then I saw the two ways that he was contrasting and the two trees and the two followers and the two foundation. And he gives us these, these uh, illustrations of how to be connected to him and how to be able to, to draw closer to him in our relationship and how needful that it actually is. Now, obviously, we have to make a decision as an individual that I want to be connected to something. You know, you can have all of the proper tools, all of the proper things in your life, but yet if we don't make that decision and say that that connection is the most important connection that we can have, then, then everything else is just not going to fall into place. It is so important to have this connection with Jesus because it is the most, it, it, is, the, it is the relationship that all other relationships are going to be formed. It is a relationship that everything is going to be around. And so I, I remember uh, my grandmother, and I had a great connection to her. She was one that, that I, I believe probably had the, the greatest connection even over my mom and my dad and my family and my brothers and sisters. She was the one that I could just show up at her house at any time. And when I showed up at her house, you know what she did what grandmas do she gives you food uh, she tells you everything's going to be okay she gives you a hug it's just a it's just a warm place to be because grandma's there it wasn't the house it was it was grandmother you know it's kind of like when when my grandkids come over to our place and and uh, they find out that it's not the place but it's the it's nanny that makes the difference in the place right because when they come over and they see Boompa is the only one that's there, they quickly will exit and go back home. But when they find out that none is there, they have a great connection with her. I had a great connection with my grandmother. My grandmother was a, a very God-fearing person. But yet, if my connection only was to her, and everything that I did, every decision I made, everything that I that, that I every path that I went down was because of her, I would still be falling short because even though she was a great person, she was not Christ. And our greatest connection that we can have is going to be Christ with every decision we make, every path that we go down, every road that we take, everything that we do is going to be based upon the greatest connection that's in our life. And if it is Christ, then all other relationships would flow from that relationship in which we have in Jesus Christ. I think that it is very necessary 
for us to emphasize that because that's where we get our identity from every time. You know, when I, when I find somebody that's going through a great deal of struggles, I also will find somebody who's struggling with their identity, who's struggling with who they are in Christ. And so we have to take a step back and we have to say whether or not that we're, we're willing to be connected to Jesus, we're willing to be connected to Christ, and if so, then that's where we find our identity. That's where we find our hope. That's where we find our joy. That's where we find our substance. That's why we find, where we find our purpose of living. And, and if we do not have that connection, then we're going to struggle with all the above. We're going to struggle with everything that we go through in life. We're going to struggle with every decision. We're going to beat ourselves up. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to be, be able to make those decisions that we need to be able to make because we do not have that connection in Christ. So the question that I ask you this morning as we start this series is whether or not you even want a connection. You want that close connection to who he is. And if we, if we say yes, then we're going to move forward. If you say no, then Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount gives us the illustrations of what's going to happen if you don't make the right decision. I love it when he tells us this because he was, he was not there to, to bring in a, a big crowd. He was not there to have a popular sermon. He wasn't there to have all the points in place, but he spoke through the Holy Spirit of God. And when he spoke, he spoke as God. And when he told us, he told us the truth that we needed to hear. And sometimes, sometimes we just don't want to hear that truth. Sometimes we don't want to hear what Christ has to say. We don't want that connection because I, I, want, to, I want to be connected to my grandmother again because my grandmother found no wrong in me. Are y'all with me? She found no wrong in me. And so when I went over there, no matter how bad I was, no matter what I went through, she still loved me. Still loved me. She cared, still cared for me. She still fed me. She was still there for me, but she found absolutely no wrong. And Christ, on the other hand, convicts. Christ, on the other hand, convicts. And that's why we have such a hard time with this connection. So there are four things here that I, that I want to want to point out. And the first one talks about the narrow gate and the wide gate. And uh, this is number one, the most needful connection, two ways, entering through the narrow gate. Now, there are some who believe that this scripture is only about salvation. I am one who does not believe that. I believe that it tells us even more of a story, not only about salvation and who we choose as our Savior, but I also believe that it gives us instruction as we go through life as a whole of whether or not we're going to go down the broad way or whether we're going to go down the pretty rough road that God has set for us. It says this, uh, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the, and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. In verse 14 it says, How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. So the very first contrast in which he brings out, he says that there is a narrow gate, there is a difficult road, but it leads to life. A narrow gate, difficult road that leads to life. And I would have to say amen to that because when we find that road to Christ, when we choose to accept him as our savior, when we choose to accept him in our life, that it's going to be a difficult road. Because now we're going against everything and every flow that this flesh loves. We're going against everything that this flesh desires. So it's going to be a difficult road, but that road leads to life. And that's just like once we've received Christ as our Savior, then we, we need to take a step back and say, are we still on this difficult road? Are we still on the right road? Because it, even though we're saved, nothing can change that. No one can take you out of the hands of God. But yet once we're saved, we can choose to start going down the other road, which is the wide gate, the broad road that leads to destruction. Now, I want you to note in the scripture that it doesn't say that this wide gate and this broad road is difficult because it is not that difficult for the flesh. It is real easy for the flesh to go down this broad road because all you have to do is find the crowd 
and just follow them. Terry and I both have a sense of leadership when we're going to activities. I don't know if y'all have are like this or not, but we'll be in a parking lot of an area that we're going to try to find the entryway of whatever we're going, whether it's a convention, whether it's a whether it's a football game at a strange stadium, whether it is, wherever it is, we walk with confidence. I'm telling you, we walk with confidence. We may not have any idea where we're going, but we walk with confidence. And we always, am I right, we always have a crowd that follows us. Are y'all with me? Because we are walking in such confidence, I haven't heard one time we were trying to get from a, from the, uh, over at the Waxahachie uh, uh, thing that they built over there that you gotta, gotta park three miles away from any field that you go to. And so we parked way out in the, wherever it was, and we were trying to get to Elijah's football game. And so we were walking and didn't have any idea which direction we were going, but we were walking in confidence as we were going there. And we had a crowd behind us following us to every closed gate that there was. And then I actually heard somebody behind me say, I thought you said they knew where they were going. Well, they never asked us if we knew, if they would have asked us. I turned around and said, I have no idea where we're going, but we're doing it with confidence. Are are y'all with me? So, So when we're talking about the broad road, don't just follow anybody, because you may get behind some nutty people like Terry and I, that have no idea which direction we're going, have no idea what's before us, but yet when it comes to Christ, please follow us. Please follow us. Because we know where we're going here, but this broad road leads to destruction. This broad road leads us to a place where we don't want to be, but yet in the flesh, it seems exactly the direction that we need to go in. But the narrow gate, the difficult road, leads to life. It's going to be tough. It's going to be rough. But yet Jesus said he would be there with us all the way. Through everything that we go through, through everything that we struggle with, through every decision that we make, through everything that we know that that it's going to be a difficult road. And listen to me, that it's not going to be easy at all. The second contrast that he gave was the two trees. Matthew 7, 15 through 21. And I kind of want to just, well, I'll just read this particular scripture. Uh, Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered by the thorn bushes or figs from the thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There are people that will be disguised of doing good for who God is. There are those that that who will be disguised, but yet inwardly they had other motives and other ideas. And the two trees here are the, every tree that, that produces good fruit and every bad tree that produces bad, bad fruit. It reminds me of when John chapter 15, when Jesus talks about being the vine, and then also in, in, in Galatians, where Paul illustrates about how we need to be the fruit bearers We need to look at our fruit. You need to look at people around you as their fruit. There are going to be two types of people that that we're going to meet, those that are for God and those that are against God. There are going to be those that are against God that verbally say it. I don't like God. I hate God. There's nothing good about God. You're going to find those in this life that we live, that we're going to find those who just have have a hatred toward that for, for some reason. But you're also going to find those who said that they love God, inwardly they're falling apart. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees as they were praying in front of everybody? They said, you're, you're just, you just want to make sure that you pray in front of everybody so everybody will think that you're religious 
Everybody will think that you're close to the Lord, but yet inside you're nothing but dead men's bones. That we get to the point when we recognize, now this is, this is not for us to go around judging people. This is not for us to, to, to see whether or not that those around us are fruit or, or, or fruitless, but it is for us to be aware of ourselves and where we stand. Don't start, don't start thinking about other people right now. Start thinking about yourself. Start thinking about where you are. Am I doing all of the things? Am I telling everybody around me who Christ is, but yet I'm actually fruitless in my life? You see, that's, that's where a lot of people are, that we have no fruit at all. If, I, I'm not much of a fruit person picker thing, and I don't because... Because let me tell you why, and, I, and I'm not, and, and let me tell you, let me just kind of throw this at you too. I, I, if, you have a, if you have a garden, God bless you, because it's, a hard, it's hard work. I know. I've seen it on YouTube. It's hard. It's hard work. <laughs> but if you have a garden that's not fenced in, please do not bring me anything out of your garden, okay? And I say that because I probably won't need it if your garden isn't fenced in, because I've seen puppies, dogs, cats, whatever, pee all over the vegetables. It may, it just, it's just, it just, you, you just need, anyway. So, so I'm not much of a, a fruit bearer person when it comes to picking something from a tree because I always think what landed on that tree. And I think it all, it all went back when I, I, somebody offered me an apple from a tree one time and it kind of reminded me of Adam and Eve but yet there was bird poop on the, on the apple. A bird pooped on it. And so it's like, I'm not going to, we just wash it off. Wash it off with what? That, that, that's going to take that memory out of, my, out of my head. So anyway, that was all free. It was just, so every good tree produces good fruit. Every bad tree produces bad fruit. We have got to look at ourselves and ask us whether or not that we have fruit. Do people know us by our fruit. Do people really understand who we are by our fruit? We have to take a step back. Again, it's easy to, to, to say that about other people, isn't it? You don't have fruit, you don't have fruit, you don't have fruit, you, don't, you have good fruit. It's easy to say that about others. I don't see any fruit in, I, in you at all. I can say that. But how hard it is for us to really look at ourselves to see whether or not we have the fruit. Whether or not that we're the one who have the bad fruit or the good fruit. The third thing that he tells us about is about the two type of followers. Matthew 7, 21, it says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I, we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name? Do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Jesus was making a point here that was later stressed through his writings and also through the New Testament about how we need to make sure that we have connected to Christ to where we know not only who we are in Christ, not only that, is, that he's our heavenly father, that he is our savior, that he is the one that we acknowledge that, that he's the Lord of our life, we've accepted him into our lives, but yet also making sure that we're not deceived into thinking just because we came to church, just because we taught Sunday school, just because we preached, just because we pastored, just because we whatever we did for him, that we really knew who he was. Because this is what I shared with you several weeks ago when we talked about understanding our relationship with him and not to be fooled and not to be, not to be deceived. Because there are folks who who really believe that they've just because they've done things for God, that they've received Christ, they're doing those things. Do not be deceived because Satan will try to take that and use that, thinking that that, that church 
attendance that you had, that Sunday school attendance that you had, those attendance that you had all the, uh, throughout, throughout your life was good enough, but yet the only thing that we need is receiving Christ as our personal Savior. The only thing that we need, this isn't just talking about that you need to be about works. It's talking about making sure that we're not deceived, making sure that we're not relying upon those works to get us where we need to get to and connected to Christ. You've got to make sure, because I believe that there's going to be many people that are being told, depart from me, I, I never knew you. I can, I can tell you, a question that was asked of me many years ago when I, uh, when I took my first pastorate position, somebody asked me whether I was saved. And you would think, what a silly question that was. Here I am called into the ministry. I'm doing everything that I'm, I'm in school for the ministry. I've taken all of these religious classes. And, you're, and I'm coming before you as a view of a call for a pastorate. And you're asking me whether I'm saved. That was a good question, wasn't it? That was a good question. Because I wonder about some pastors. Are y'all with me? I mean, just, I wonder about some pastors now of whether or not that they're actually saved, whether or not they actually have fruit in their life, whether or not that they're, that they're doing the things that God wants them to do only for outward appearance, but yet they understand who Christ is. Jesus said, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. I think, when we get to heaven, I think there are going to be people that you're shocked that are there. And I think you're going to be even more shocked who isn't there. Are y'all with me? I think you are. I, I, I hope everybody that was in my family is there. I hope I have a great reunion with them. I hope that we can all get together. But as nice as grandmother was, Grandma may not be there. I, I, I never asked her whether she's ever received Christ as her Savior. I was, I was way too caught up in the pancakes and, the, and whatever else that she had to offer me. I never, I never asked her as a, as a young kid. I think I was six, seven years old, typically when I went to her house. But I, I hope that she's there. But I may be shocked. Just because she was nice, just because she did the things that grandmas do, doesn't bring you in the presence of an almighty God. Only receiving him is the only thing it's going to do. Not a church membership, not how many times that you come here, how few times that you come here, doesn't matter. But yet we need to make sure that when I announce to them, I want to be accepted in that place. Are y'all with me? I don't know. I, I can't describe it to you. I think the Bible is very clear on kind of what it is, but, but I get stuck at the transparent gold thing. I, I, don't even, I don't even understand that. So if I don't, I think it was on purpose that he didn't tell us everything that was going to happen in heaven. But yet I do know I don't want to be left out. And I do know I don't want my loved ones to be left out. I do know that I, I don't want some of my neighbors left out. Are y'all with me? And, and, I, and, and I'm just trying to keep you awake. And, and I, I do know that I, I want to have that connection with Jesus enough to where I am convicted of sharing Christ with those around me. I'm convicted of having a conversation that is, that's rough and that's tough with people around me. And yet, on their dying bed, it seems to be easier to talk to them about it. But yet, just a casual conversation, sometimes it's tough, sometimes it's rough. But I don't want those people to be left out. I don't want my friends to be left out. I don't want people around me that I've known forever. And I certainly don't want Jesus telling me, no, he didn't make it because you never told him about who Jesus was. I certainly don't want to be told that. Here's the fourth thing that he tells us. Is that there's two foundations. There's two foundations. 
Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 25. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because the foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed and it collapsed with a great crash. You see, the wise person built their house upon the rock, built their house on a stable foundation, and it is still simple, simple things today as we build houses, we see houses are built, and we say, that house ain't going to last very long, because <laughs> this uh, you saw the sand that they put under it to try to make it look good before they laid the foundation. Even though that the foundation of concrete is laid, but yet the concrete is now on a bunch of sand, it's eventually going to slide. These million-dollar houses are now five-million-dollar houses that are just falling off the edge of the uh, edge of the ocean because all of the sand that was underneath it finally gave way. And even though that it was on a good concrete foundation, it wasn't built on the rock. Our relationship with Jesus. And the needful connection is to making sure that our relationship and our life is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And if it is not, when the storms come, that's when we're going to fall apart. When the storms come, that's when we're not going to make it. You see, anybody can make it in nice weather. When it's 72 degrees, just think about this for a moment, 72 degrees outside, it's just a beautiful day or a beautiful morning, and in a beautiful sunrise, anybody can enjoy that. But then when the storms come, when tragedy strikes, when 120 degree heat comes in, all of a sudden you're no longer out on the patio and sitting there drinking your coffee and uh, things are just, uh, things seem to be worse when the storms come. Things, things just don't look the same when it's not as nice out. And that's the way it is within our life. We need to understand that, that we need to see where our foundation is, which is on the rock. Because the storm's going to come, and it's going to prove where your foundation is. So here's how you can tell. When the storms hit, and they keep hitting, and they keep hitting, and you're still standing on the solid rock, you're able to get through everything that you've gone through. It doesn't mean that you're not weary. It doesn't mean that you're, you're just going through it with enthusiasm. That's not what it means at all. But we survive the storm, and we're still standing strongly. Or we can have a great collapse with a great crash. And that's where even in a Christian life, that's where a lot of us are. And that's what a lot of us have experienced before. So it's not a time to, be, uh, to evaluate whether or not that that you come to the church enough, you're reading the Bible enough. No, the evaluation is of whether or not you're connected, and that connection is that you have the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And it's, again, not to point out to other people, not to say you're falling apart in the midst of the storm, you need to get your life straightened out. It is talking to us. Jesus didn't say you need to start looking at other people around you that's here. He, started, he said, look at yourself. Look at the wise man who builds his house upon the rock, and when the rain fell, the rivers rose, the wind blew, and pounded that house. I remember my family talked me into going camping one year. One year they taught me going to camping. And we had our tent set up. The kids had all their tents set up. We were just enjoying the night. Wasn't it a beautiful, it was a beautiful evening. It was. We were right there by the water. I mean, probably 15 feet from the water. And then the rain came. And then the wind blew. Pounded our tent. All of a sudden, we, we hear ruffling from the other children's family. They were flooded out. Their tent had collapsed. 
they were getting their stuff together and getting in their car. And I, and I looked at Terry and I said, well, thank goodness our tents. And at the, about that time, I felt, I, I felt either Terry was peeing the bed or <laughs> there was water coming from a little river. And that's what it was. There came a, made the river of water right through our tent. And then all of a sudden, the wind came, blew our tent over. We, we ran to the car. We spent the rest of the night in the car. And I said to myself, this is fun. This is fun. <laughs> this is why I don't go camping. This is why, the only, you know, I'm always, if, when the times that we've gone camping, we've always been in our little pup tent. And every time somebody pulls up in a 45-foot big old long camper bus, and they have all, they, they click on their air conditioner, you, you hear it click on, they bring out their satellite dish and if, everything, and I'm over here in the tent trying, and so, so one year that we went, I brought my own air conditioner. I did, I brought a window unit. I put a window unit in our tent. I brought our satellite, because I wanted, a, I wanted a satellite when I was out there. And then I started looking around, and I didn't want to go outside. It was just too hot. It was just too hot to be outside. And then I started asking the question, why am I even here? Because I can do everything I'm doing here at home, and so why, why am I even here? So, you know, I, I think camping is great. It's a good, a good bonding time, but yet I, I, I would rather just go to a hotel and just have bonding time there. But yet that showed me how easy and quickly your foundation can fall apart. And I know some of you have been in that same situation. I know some of you have known what it means to have your foundation just falling apart. As many of you know, as we had gotten ready for retirement, we live in a, we live in a 45-foot RV, which is really a nice RV. And yet, yet sometimes our tires go flat. Are you all with me? Now, it's, it's, my foundation is a little bit easier to fix than some of y'all's foundation that go with the traditional route and actually living in a home, right? And uh, so we just go out there and we, we adjust it and we uh, air up the tire a little bit more and it brings up our house to where it needs to be now. And, and I, I don't want that kind of foundation in my real life. I don't want that foundation to where, where I, it just keeps faltering and keeps failing and, and yet a foolish man builds his house on a foundation that is going to fail. I was looking this morning at some, uh, some clip art from these guys who make beautiful sculptures in the sand out at Galveston and other places. Beautiful. I mean, just beautiful art. And yet when they're making it, they know that it's going to disappear in a few hours. And it's incredible to me that they put so much time and so much effort in something that they know is just going to fall apart. And, and even though that that was beautiful, it reminded me of how much effort we put in to a foundation that's going to fall apart. Because if we're, if we're trying to build our foundation in this world, we're trying to build it on finances. We're trying to build it on our understanding of how things are going. We're looking around us and, and looking at the foundation that's being built and that has been built within our society. And that is a foundation that will eventually come down with the great crash. For those that you are, that, that you are struggling and that you're worried about how the world is going and what's happening within our government and what's happening within our schools, let me tell you what's going to happen. It will collapse with a great crash. Are you all with me? I'm telling you, it's going, it's going to have its day. It's going to have its day. So take a step back, turn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, build our foundation where it needs to be built as a wise man builds his house upon the rock. So today... As we begin this particular series, I ask that you'll make some, ask some questions for you, your life, whether or not that you're where you need to be on all four of these, that you really want to be connected to Jesus, well, especially when we get to the connection to individuals and to our families, 
You know, there are individuals that are falling apart all over the place because of this lack of connection. There are families that are falling apart all over the place because of a lack of this connection with Jesus. There, there, there are churches that are falling apart because of the lack of connection to Jesus. This connection is so important. And I, I don't want to be one of those appliances and I, and I say this loosely, that look good. Yeah, yeah with me. I don't want to be an appliance that's non-functional. Because, you know, they, they can last forever because they're not functioning at anything. And so I want to be one that is functioning. I want to be one that's plugged in. I want to be one that is really connected to my Heavenly Father. Even though that the road is going to be rough, even though that it's going to be narrow, even though that it's going to be tough to go down, but yet my, since my foundation is upon the rock, I am able to handle it through Christ Jesus. So if you find yourself distraught all the time, if you find yourself discouraged, if you find yourself watching news over and over and over again about the state of this world that we live in, Hang on. Don't try to change that. Don't try to think that you need to run for president or you need to run for governor or whatever, that what God wants from us is to be connected to Christ, that our whole attitude will change. Our vision will change. Our ideology will change. Our, 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 our look at the future is going to change. I know today that there are Christians who have so much struggle with this that it actually is, has intervated their, their individual life, their family life, the church life, and that they struggle every moment because of things that they can't control out in this world. The things that we can control is our relationship with Christ. The things that we can look at is our relationship with Christ. I want to make sure that every road that I go down, every path that I take, every decision that I make, every direction that I go is not just because I want to feel good, not just because the road is wide and everybody goes there, but I want to make sure that it is Christ who's leading me. I want to make sure that it is God because he is the one that's in control. He's the one that gives clear direction to us. Now, I wish that we had, and I, and I know that you do too, wish that we had a, had a cloud over our head during the day and a pillar of fire at night showing us what direction that we need to go in. Remember the Israelites? That, that we, we just go in that direction and we're here. And at night when we go to sleep, we see the pillar of fire, we know we're in the right place. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have? But God has given us the Holy Spirit of God to be able to lead us, guide us, and connect us to who Jesus is. And it's going to be up to us how much of that we want. It's going to be up to us how much of that we're going to receive. And I have to tell you, I have to take a step back every day and ask myself the same question. Am I really connected where I needed to be? Am I really connected? Is my foundation really on the rock? Is my decision really based upon who Christ is? Am I a fruit bearer? Am I one that's just ready, ready, to, ready to go at any time, ready to share Christ at any time, ready to, to have an understanding with people and a conversation with people at any time? And I have to say that I struggle with it, but yet I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm surrendering this over to the Lord and saying, Lord, I need help in these areas. But I want that firm foundation. So this morning, this invitation is going to be for each of us of whether or not, you know, we're going to make a decision. Whether we're going to make a decision to be connected to Jesus or we're not. We're just going to continue to have that outward appearance or not. Some people can have an outward appearance and they don't have any struggle being good. But I'm going to tell you, there are some people that have to have Jesus to be good. Are y'all with me? I, I, I know a lot of people that, that with, with, there are just some people that are just nice. And there, there's just some people that's just natural. With, without Christ, they're just as nice as can be. But yet I know other people 
that without Christ, they're just as mean as all, all get out. And so we need to use this for our time and to make our decision of whether or not we're, we're where we need to be. And I'm going to ask Robert to come, and I'm going to ask for you to stand. And let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and surrender this invitation over to him. Father, we just exalt your name. We thank you so much for all that you do. We pray, Father, for your guidance. We pray, Father, for your due diligence in our lives. We pray, Father, for your conviction. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God would just touch each of our hearts. Show us what we need to do. Lead us in the decisions that we need to make. And, Father, thank you for all that you do. And we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. I see bright crimson robes dripped over the ashes, a wide open tomb where there should be a cast. Children are singing, dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming.